There you go. Is that better? Oh, Mama D's in camera. I still can't hear. There you go. Is that better? Is that better? Hey, we got it. Oh, Mama D's in camera. <laughs> Sound is back. We're good. Now I just got to get rid of this menu. How do I get rid of this now? <laughs> there we go. All right. Yep. You have sound. Ola Martin's on too. There you go. Well, hey, it looks like we're ready to go here. I don't think I even need the headphones, but I'll wear them anyway. Hey, good evening, everybody. My name is Chris Hammond from Lakeland Auto Marine. Uh, we, I thought we'd have a little uh, question and answer session here. It's middle of winter. It's boring. Snowing here in Ohio. Not sure what it's doing in your neck of the woods, but... Um, Looks like we're all set to go here. Uh, welcome, everybody. And I think there was a question already from uh, Douglas Fett, looks like. He says, hi, I've got a question on a 41 Flathead V12. Uh, it was rebuilt for four or 500 miles. It smokes a little, and I wonder thicker oil. Well, what color does it smoke? I, I assume it's smoking blue. Uh, what color is it smoking, Doug? Blue. All right. Yes. Um, what kind of oil are you running? I, I don't care about brands so much. Are you running you know, like a straight 30 weight or what, 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 what viscosity oil are you running? What kind of a flathead V12 is it? Like a Ford flathead, I take it, like a like a Lincoln. Okay. I I would say ten thirty is probably a little light, but I mean, it's a, if it's a fresh build, I will say in a marine engine, something that works, you know, pretty hard. Um, you might want to step up to straight 30, but if, if it's smoking, um, hmm. how, how many, how many, hour, how many hours you have on it so far? Four or 500 miles. Oh, it's a car. I'm sorry. God, I'm not even listening here. Sorry. Um, I thought it was a boat because technically our topic is uh, inboard and, uh, IO Marine engines, but hell we'll talk flatheads. It doesn't matter. Um, I'm trying to think the PCV or the intake system. I mean, does it run? Does it run good? Oh, it's in a boat. Okay. It only smokes at idle. You don't have a um, God. This would be a long shot, but it, if it's got a small vacuum leak into the valley, um, it might be pulling oil up through that. That's a possibility if it's doing that. But man, that, that would be, I just did a V12 uh, flathead well, about a year and a half ago on a 48 Lincoln. You know, it's, it's kind of, one thing you can do is, um, you could do a cranking vacuum test. This is an old school test. Um, uh, here's what, here's how you perform a, a, a cranking vacuum test. So you're going to want to back the uh, idle screw completely out of the carburetor. Well, not completely out, but back off the, the throttle stop screw, you know, where you adjust the idle and close those butterflies 100% complete. Um, I don't think there's a breather on there. No. Um, then connect a vacuum gauge to your intake manifold. Yeah, there, there should have been like a vacuum port for vacuum wipers uh, on the back of the intake. And then connect your vacuum gauge and uh, disable spark and disable fuel if you can. And crank the engine for probably 10 seconds. The vacuum should probably peak somewhere. Pro if the engine's healthy and everything, should peak probably 18, 19 inches. And as soon as you stop cranking, monitor the gauge. Um, if, if everything is clean and tight, you know, this depends on your carburetor setup and everything too. Uh, the vacuum is going to slowly dissipate. If the vacuum dissipates really, really quickly, 
then you probably most likely you probably have a leak because if you think about it you know when you're cranking the engine if you block off the uh, intake you could also tape the carburetor are you running like a 97 stromberg or something on it or um i'm, I'm guessing or or a holly but um you if you if you somehow block off like take some uh tape or the problem with tape is it'll it'll suck in because believe it or not the engine you know when you try to choke it off it, it, it's going to suck that tape in um i would i would take like a cap almost like a the, the, we use them in our smoke machine on automotive work there's a um uh, it's, it's a plastic cap that fits over the carbon and we take duct tape and then we'll we'll tape it so it's nice and tight because the problem is is if you have it sealed correctly the engine is going to start to sound funny when you crank it because it can't breathe so it doesn't take much cranking you know probably five ten seconds max i'm going to say and then see if the gauge bleeds off if the gauge bleeds off right away then either a you don't have your carburetor completely you know uh, blocked off or you've got an internal leak but God, that, that valley is so high in there. That, that'd be hard to believe that you're getting oil oil through that unless that unless that gas gets compromised somehow. Um, does it uh, does it idle good? I mean, does it have a nice smooth idle, you know, four or five hundred RPM? Or is it idle really uh, erratic? It idles smooth. Okay. Well, if it idles smooth and there can't be a, a, a really gross leak, what kind of vacuum do you have at idle? Did you put a vacuum gauge on it by chance? Yeah, oil pressure, that's fine, of course, but the, the oil pressure really doesn't have a whole lot to do, um, doesn't have, have a lot to do with vacuum, but... Um, I'd put a vacuum gauge on it and see what you've got. You know, an engine like that, I wouldn't be surprised if we've got 18, 19 inches of mercury, you know, at idle. But if it's, if it's, what makes me think if it's only smoking at idle, you know, you only have vacuum at idle, you know. So, you know, when you're off idle, especially at wide open throttle too, with those throttle blades open, there's nothing to hold vacuum. So obviously your vacuum is the highest when the butterflies are nearly closed. So, you know, that's why I'm thinking maybe you got some kind of vacuum leak, but if not, then I, I don't know if your rings haven't seated yet. Um, I know. Did they did they put the uh, 49 to 53 uh, valve guides in it? Do you know they they didn't put the split mushroom valves uh, back in that, did they? I'm not sure how familiar you are with the build, but I know a popular upgrade to those is you run the 49 to 53 valves and valve guides, which is a single piece guide. Um, and they have O-rings. Oh, okay. There's O-rings on the um, um, on the guides. So, because on, on a flathead, the, 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 the guides are very, very big. You know, probably like three quarters of an inch or something like that. Well, the original guides on that early V12 would have been a split design. The bottom of the valve would have a big mushroom on it. So there was a tool that went in there um, and and, uh, and and got those out, so to speak. Uh, well, there's a tool to, to pull the springs, but um, a lot of times when we rebuild them, we, we, we don't even put those seals on the exhaust hardly at all because the seals are very, very hard to get in. And the only way you can get oil through the engine usually is through the intake side because that's where the vacuum is. So I don't know if there's a, a compromised guide in it, but I mean, it sounds like you got some time on it. And if it's smoking pretty good, it's, it's got to have oil from somewhere. Uh, what do the spark plugs look like? Do you see anything with the spark plugs? Uh, does it look like you can maybe pinpoint it to a cylinder or cylinders? That's why I wonder if they've got something with those, um, like I say, with the guides or whatever. Okay. Well, my, my guess is be something to do with, um, like I say, I, you could check vacuum just for, but it, it may or may not tell you a whole lot. Because if, if it idles good, my, my guess is your vacuum is going to be good. Um, 
Let's also hear some ticking. Hmm. See, maybe originally that engine would have had a hydraulic valve train. Uh, the V12s had hydraulic uh, all the way through 48. And um, the, the last V12 I did, I converted it to, to, um, to an adjustable. So not knowing if you have the hydraulic valve train or not. Um, believe it or not, I have a video uh, of, of that uh, of a of a newer a forty six to forty eight V twelve flathead rebuild on our YouTube page. If you uh, click on that, it's kind of long. It's probably like a half hour or so long. Uh, you can watch that and you can see what I'm talking about. I point out the changes from going from hydraulic to a um, to a solid valve train. But um, yeah, I mean it's probably fine to run. Um, other than it's probably annoying. It's probably a cool old boat with a cool engine. I mean, you're probably kind of embarrassed with it smoking, I'm sure. But um, I, I probably would run it, yes. I probably would run a little thicker oil. I probably wouldn't run 10W30. I probably would run a straight weight oil, um, straight 30. Um, is it using oil? That I suppose I should ask that question as well. I, have, have you uh, been adding to it? or? But, I mean, without disassembly, it's, it's going to be tough to tell, I would think. For those of you just joining us, uh, I'm Chris. Thought we'd uh, do a live uh, question and answer thing here. We always get uh, questions, you know, phoned into us at work and stuff. And I thought now would be a good time. You know, it's the middle of winter and I've got time to do it. So instead of trying to get somebody in during work hours, obviously. Um, I see Chris from Tangle Tackled. Yes, uh, we have your carburetors done, actually. Uh, I, I took a video of it. And uh, we're actually going to ship them back tomorrow to you, uh, Chris. So um, I just haven't had time to upload it. I was working on some other stuff today. So no problem, Doug. Uh, let us know uh, how, how it makes out. But I, I would try some thick oil on that on that Ford V12 there. Any other uh, questions? Anything? Just anything generally you guys want to talk about? Any questions about your boat engines or something I might be able to help you with? I don't think I missed any other questions here in the chat. What kind of boat is that, Doug? You didn't say um, what you got that flathead in, or maybe you did. Maybe I missed it. I see Adam's on. Hi, Adam. How are you? Adam works with us. He uh, he just took a Ford six liter cab off yesterday, so he's all excited to do another Ford head gasket job. Thank God they don't use those in boats. <laughs> oh, so it's a custom boat bill. Yeah, <laughs> good. <laughs> Yeah, we could do a 6-0 question and answer. My battery would probably go dead my computer, get done answering questions about those. <laughs> any other uh, any other questions from the uh, from the group? Anything? Does everybody just want to hear me talk all night? I don't care. Tell you a topic I, I don't mind talking about is um, I um, we, there's always a question about mechanical surveys. Um, you know, one of the questions we get is, "Hey, I'm looking at a boat. You know, I want a mechanical survey done. You know, what's the point in it? Is it should I do it? You know, how is it done? Um, you know, I, I have an opinion on mechanical surveys. You know, my first opinion is if if you're looking at a vessel is is to if if it's an older vessel the the first thing i would do is i i would see trial the vessel that would be the very very first thing i would do if if you look at it and you like how the boat looks and it's kind of cool i would see trial the vessel if the vessel performs correctly and sounds good runs good if you're not sure you can try to bring a mechanic along um then the next step i would do would be i would hire a marine surveyor to inspect the condition of the fiberglass or wood or whatever it is. Um, 
And, you know, a, a good Marine surveyor, depending on the length of the boat, could cost anywhere from, you know, 300 bucks to a thousand bucks, taking a guess. I'm not a surveyor. I don't know, but just taking a guess. But to me, if you're going to spend, let's say, $70,000 on a 25 year old boat, you know, 34 foot or whatever, you know, I think spending that kind of money on a, on a professional hull survey is, is a very, very good idea. You know, you want to make sure the stringers are good. You want to make sure the hull's good, all that stuff. Now back to my mechanical survey, you know, a lot of guys come in and say, Hey, I want to do a compression test, you know, uh, and, and let, let, you know, that, that might tell me if my engine's good or bad. Yes. If the compression test fails, yes, there's probably some problems internally, you know, valves, pistons, rings, whatever. But the one issue with the mechanical survey is, is it can't tell oil burning. You know, it, it maybe or maybe not can t t uh, find a performance complaint, uh, something like that. That's why I say run the boat first. You know, if the boat runs good, you know, at least it does. Then you can have the other stuff checked if you want. But the other thing with mechanical surveys is a lot of times they're not properly performed. And what I mean by that is, you know, the engine, to, for instance, if you want to do a compression test, you know, the engine should be at operating temperature. Okay. I know we talk about this on a couple other boards. You know, you, you need the engine warmed up. You need all eight spark plugs removed. All of them need to be removed. You need to throttle it wide open. So, um, you know, take your throttle levers, push them all the way wide open, and then go one at a time. Screw your gauge in and go through there. Any other way you could get erroneous readings on the compression test. So if you do it like, like right now, most of these boats are in storage, at least up here where we're at in Ohio. Um, you know, these boats are in storage. They don't really have, you know, they've been sitting for three months. You know, the oil, the cylinders are kind of dry. If you go in there and you screw gauge in and start cranking it over while it's in a heat of storage, you know, you're probably not going to get the correct reading. You know, it's got 30, 40 weight oil in it. It's been sitting in there since October and the batteries are half dead or whatever. And you're going to go over there and roll this thing over. And then all of a sudden, you know, I've seen a lot of deals get killed on engines that weren't bad. So customer calls me up and says, hey, Chris, I'm looking at this boat. You know, I, I've got a hundred, you know, I've got a V8 engine. It's got you know, 105, you know, 110, 105, 103, 97, and, and like a 130 or something like that. And, and I'll just say, look, you know, how was it performed? Well, I was in a store, you know, I tell them, say, if you still like the boat, go run it, you know, because honestly, a compression test only has, the, it only can do one function. And that function is to test the cylinder's ability to seal. That's all it can do. It, it can hardly pick up a flat cam. I mean, if the cam's really, really bad, yes, you know, but as long as the intake valve, you know, somewhat opens and closes, the compression is going to be good you know, uh, so, or, or very close to good. So it's, it's not going to tell that it's not going to tell ignition problems, that kind of thing. So there's a lot of, you know, money put into compression tests and it's, it's, it's only, you know, a, a third of what really could, could happen, obviously. So, um, that, that's just my misstatement on mechanical surveys when you guys are looking at boats, cause that is one of the most common questions we get asked. So I, I'm actually, like I said, just run the boat. If the boat runs good, buy it. It's, it's a used boat, right? I mean, it's not brand new. So, uh, you know, if we're going to spend all these money and checking all this stuff. Now, on diesel vessels, I know they like to do, a lot of the diesel guys like to do oil samples. That's not a bad idea. You know, one thing with an oil sample, what most oil analysis groups will tell you is if you sample something for the first time, you know, They'll, they'll give you like a, a statement, say, hey, it's got this much, you know, metal or copper or iron, that kind of stuff in it. But since they've never sampled it before, they don't have anything to go by. So most oil labs are going to say, hey, you know, sample it now and then sample it again next oil change or at a, at a specific interval. Then we can kind of get what might be going on, you know, because if I turn something in, hey, the copper's, uh, you know, seven. Well, what's that mean? Is that high? Is that, you know, is that low? Is that, oh my God, we got to take the oil pan off. You know, what, what does that mean? You know, but if you've had seven the whole time, you know, throughout its course of its history, then that's normal. So, um, I, I know a lot of these guys, like I say, they, they do oil samples on the tran training transmissions, the, you know, the gears and the engines and they send them off. And yes, a high number, if something's totally ridiculous, 
you know, it, it'll show up. But like I say, most of the time on the bottom, on the bottom print there, it's just going to say, Hey, first time, you know, we can't tell you a whole lot till we get a second or third or fourth or whatever. So um, that's, that's my statement on surveys and oil samples and so forth again, but you know, anything you do, you know, could help you, but you know, some of the things I see is, you know, people put too much into this stuff, you know, run it, you know, I, it's, that's just my theory. You know, you yes, compression tests. Okay. Oil samples. Okay. But it could still blow up. I mean, we can do all this stuff and it, you know, spend all this money checking it out, but it's still a 30 year old boat or 20 year old boat or 15 year old boat with, you know, 800, a thousand hours. I mean, it could, it could still go. So, uh, obviously you try to prevent those issues, but that's my theory on that. Uh, is there any other questions, anything, uh, Anything out there you're thinking about or anything boat related diagnostics? I think we just had really the one question on the Lincoln, I think. So Coyote says where to find parts for 30 year old boats. Well, what, what kind of parts are you looking for? What kind of boat do you have? What kind of engines are in it too? What else can you uh, tell me? Of course, in our neck of the woods, 30 year old boat, <laughs> it's kind of a new boat because in fresh water here on Lake Erie, Oh, 37 Marinette, 454s. So those are probably Crusaders then. Uh, that's not too bad. Um, you know, Crusader, Crusader's still pretty easy uh, to get most stuff for. In fact, Crusaders are probably some of my favorite uh, favorite engines. You know, I, I think personally, that's a Chris's opinion. They make the cleanest uh, inboard packages. You know, their hosing and, and everything is, is uh, very easy um they've always been a very friendly company um but uh you know any any uh most anything for that is is no problem you know obviously the base engines of chevrolet uh, that'll have cast iron transmissions in it if it's a uh actually wouldn't that be a 39 i thought they made i thought they quit making 37s in the 70s i thought i didn't know they made a 37 marinette in um in the 80s I thought, I thought it was uh, 39s and 41s or maybe I could be wrong, but um, the, um, but yeah, that, that, that's no problem. Um, 1990. Okay. So yeah, that, 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 that shouldn't be any issue uh, there. Where, where are you located at Coyote? Oh, Southern Ohio. Okay, so you must be on the Ohio River then. Um, I'm not sure who's down there. Obviously, with online and that, there's there's a lot of mail order stuff. I mean, obviously, we have stuff. We ship stuff. I mean, you could always call us. Uh, for that engine, we probably have quite a bit in stock. You know, we, I know we have, uh, if it's closed cool, we have all the hoses, thermostats, distributor parts. Um, 1990, that might even have the Delco 8 error. That could have pressed light or it could have, uh, um, or it could have a um, Delco EST. Um, but, um, you know, reg regular tune up parts and that you should be able to find somewhere near you because that, that'll just have MR 43 T AC plugs. Um, you, do you have a Marine source near you or you have a, um, a local Marina or, or parts house down there? See John shade. I see him on the Marinette forum all the time. How you doing, John? Yes, sort of. <laughs> I know it's tough. I, I tell you one thing with, with boat parts, I know one of the reasons we're, we're very fortunate, been very busy is you call these places, especially if you go to a big box store and I'm not here to trash big box stores, but um, 
you know, O'Reilly's, you know, the Irish store or zone or, or, uh, you know, advanced, something like that. You know, if it's not in the computer, these guys can't help you. Uh, you know, they're, they're used to looking up a license plate off a car and, and, and looking up, uh, you know, brake pads and stuff like that. Well, you know, these old boats have distributors and electronic, you know, pieces that modern cars haven't had for quite some time now. So, uh, you know, I, it's, it's, it's very tough. And, you know, if you don't really have a good Marine parts house there and you're relying on Amazon or somebody like that, which that, that can be a crapshoot too, because then you're the lookup person, you're right. You're the one Googling everything or trying to find everything out, you know, then you start getting the wrong parts and so forth. But, um, like I say, we can always help you out. You know, I prefer, you know, if folks can get stuff at their local area, that's the best. You know, if you have a local parts house, you know, independent, which aren't many around anymore. Somebody that's got some knowledge. That's where I tell folks to try to try to do business. But, um, you know, that's. Uh, but is there anything specific you're looking for? Is there is there a specific piece or I know you said odds and ends. Is there something there? electrical you talking like starters and alternators or distributor parts now on your distributor uh does it have uh this is almost like a quiz is there is there two wires coming out of the distributor and is one purple and is one black and it has two phillips screws to hold the cap down because that that should have the press delight bid ignition Um, that module is actually, uh, if it's a distributor I'm thinking of, which it's what it should have in 1990, um, that module is obsolete, uh, from press to light. The only thing that works if you want to keep that same distributor is a Protronics, um, conversion kit. Uh, it's a part number 1589. Um, that drops right into that distributor for, you know, if, if that module assembly would go bad, which, if, if I were you, and obviously this is twins, um, I probably would source one of those and, and keep it on the boat. Because if you take that to a local parts house, they're going to look like it, that you're on drugs or something because nobody's going to know what that <laughs> Nobody's going to know what that is. So um, you might want to um, stock up on it. And if not, um, you can always contact me and send me pictures and uh, I, uh, I, can, I can tell you what it is with pictures. Um, now, John, you had a question. You thought you had some gunned up fuel or something. Let me scroll back here. Um, you said you had an 86 Marinette 454. No problem, Coyote. Like I say, if you, if you got any questions, you know, my, my email is Chris H C H R I S H at Lakeland auto Marine.com. I think I can actually type that in here. So it's in the chat. I'm going to attempt to do that, see what happens. Bam. Nice. So you can always uh, email me pictures, you know, what you have or whatever. And, uh, and I don't mind giving out part numbers. I, you know, I'm doing, I'm not doing this to, to, uh, you know, boost our business per se. I'm doing it because I like to help people out. So I always tell people, you know, I'll, I'll give out part numbers and, and say, Hey, this is what you're looking for. Go, go find it. If you can't find it, we'll be glad to help you. Um, that that's not a problem because I just enjoy helping people and, and fixing old boats or new boats, whatever it is. So, um, so, uh, John, uh, nope. Oh, there's, you said your boat does run good now, John, you said you rebuilt the carb and, and runs good. You must also have a crusader then if you said you had a 454 as well, right? Yeah. Actually, I'm, maybe, uh, I'm going to be putting a Quadrajet rebuild video up here pretty quick. Um, we just finished one today for a customer who's actually on here. Uh, he was up there at Tangled Tackle. Uh, Chris, he's up in Manistee, Michigan. Um, he actually sent us two carbures uh, from his neck of the woods. 
And uh, he asked that we would videotape the uh, process. So I did that. I just didn't have time today to uh, get it edited and uploaded. But uh, I will do that. You'll probably find that interesting. Um, so you said everything runs good now. You said you had you had a gummed up fuel system and it messed up the carb and you rebuilt the carb and put it back together. All right, Doug, uh, going through two Crusader 270s and a TR 2700, would you recommend converting to Delco ESD distributors? You know what? I probably would if you want to go electronic. Um, I would assume if you probably have Mallory in it now, you're probably, you know, a late, uh, I don't know what year you're dealing with. Uh, what year are your engines, actually, if you could type that in? It must be, if it's a 27-foot tier, it's got to be like an 86, 7, something like that. I'm going to say 85. Nineteen eighty six. Okay, so nineteen eighty six is last year. I think they used Mallory in those. So that distributor is uh, pretty much obsolete as far as internal parts. So the only thing you can buy for those, to my knowledge, is just points condenser and cap and rotors. So yes, I would upgrade that. Um, I do like the EST distributors. They're they're a little uh, they're a little cumbersome to put in. If you buy like the United kits or the Voyager kits. You know, you got to cut your wiring and stuff, and there's a special timing procedure that you have to adhere to. One good thing about the EST, just like you asked, is uh, there's no advanced springs. The advance is all done in the electronic module, so you don't have to worry about rusty weights, rusty springs, broken springs, that kind of stuff. So that is a huge, huge advantage to the Delco EST. I'm a, I am a big fan of those. Um, we never sold a lot of those in, in, uh, when we, when people were really converting to electronic, probably 10 years ago, uh, we actually sold that press light distributor that, uh, that, uh, um, that, that crusader had that, that press light BID. But then when press light went out of business for the second or third time, uh, we couldn't get any more parts for those. So now we are selling the EST system. Um, I like the press light system the best because it was two wires and it dropped right in and bam, done. You know, one thing with this Delco EST is you cannot use a car module. So the distributor that you're talking about was used originally in the cars from 1987 to 1985, pickup trucks. But it was used in some cars too, like some Caprices and stuff. Um, but that specific system was meant to be used with a computer. So all those cars, because 87 was the first year of throttle body injection in, in the in the automobile line so uh you know the the, the ecu because pretty much all gm cars had an ecu from 1981 so the ecu would control timing well when you put this est setup in the est module has its own timing map well the car module like if you go to napa or, or autozone or whatever if you put a car module in there, it won't advance. I mean, you'll probably have seven, eight degrees max. So the, the Marine module part number uh, is key to that. So that's the only bad thing about that is that module is kind of special. Um, it's a D1965A Elko, and I'm going to type that in there so you can write it down or, or so forth. Uh, and that's an AC Delco number. And... Um, I'm not sure if standard ignition makes that, um, but um, yes, I, I do recommend it. Like I say, it's a little bit of push-ups as far as the wiring, you know, because you got to cut some things and and it's got a square coil and you got to change the wires. Which those kits come with wires because the cap has spark plug ends on it. But uh, but yes, I do recommend that. Um, I see. There's another question: Is rebuilding the carb something that a novice mechanic can tackle? Well, uh, what kind of carburetor is it? Would be my first question. Um, and on that module, back to Doug's question real quick while we're waiting to, for Mark's uh, carburetor uh, question, is, um, like I say, that module number is if you ever have to replace it. So, because like I say, if you if you put a car module in there and you wonder why one engine's two, 300 RPM lower than the other, that could be why. Because I, I know that D1965A module uh, advances approximately 15, 16 degrees. So if your initial is 10 or 8, there's your, you know, 24 to 26 degrees total advance, which is fine for today's fuel. 
but you put a car module in there, uh, it, it's not going to advance right with a carbureted system with standalone. You can put a car module in the fuel injected marine engine. It's not a problem because the modules run on the show. But when the module has to run the show itself, the ignition module, you need that module. Any other questions while we're waiting for um, Mark's uh, carburetor or whatever he's working on? As far as rebuilding a carburetor, I mean, it, obviously it depends what kind of carburetor you have, but you know, the big thing about carburetors is, is clean. Um, the number one failure of a carburetor is debris, you know, dirt, you know, whatever. So, um, you know, get, getting all the passageways clean, blowing through everything uh, is, is a big, big deal. Um, adjustments can be another, you know, float level, choke, accelerator pump. You know, quadrajets are probably the easiest, in my opinion. AFBs are probably a close second, if not easier. You know, especially in the boats. You know, one thing about a boat is normally, at least the stuff we're talking about here so far tonight, is we don't have a whole lot of emission devices. Now, that's a lot different, you know, or excuse me, that's, that's kind of different today because, you know, in 2010, uh, any boat 2010 or newer is supposed to have a catalytic converter, just like your car. So, um, that, um, that changes everything. So now we, cause we're, and now we're going to have carbon canisters on boats. Uh, they're, they're already out there. Okay. Mark, you got, uh, Chrysler's. All right. So you got Carter FBs, you know, th those are, those are a pretty straightforward carburetor. Um, they're an excellent carburetor, probably one of my favorites personally. Um, I'm probably going to do a video on one of these here. I, like I said, I just did a quadrajet today that I that I'll get uploaded on there. I'll do an AFB on there too. That way, it's it shows what you need to look for. But um, if if you've got general mechanical skills, you know you could probably get it done. The carb kits are cheap for those things. You know they're probably you know thirty to fifty bucks. Uh, the floats are brass. So you don't have to worry about you know bra usually hardly ever does a float go bad in one of those. So. Um, Float might be a little tricky to come by, depending on where you're located, but um, uh, that 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 should be a problem. That that carburetor part number should be a 9263s, I believe. So, um, if it's still got the tags, in fact, I'll type that in. That year should be a 9263s. So that was a that was a very good. Like I said, that, that's probably one of my favorite carburetors of all time. And if you want a little trivia, uh, the, you know what AFB actually stands for? It stands for aluminum four barrel. Um, that's what the that's what that uh, AFB actually stands for. Just useless knowledge that I know that I. <laughs> But uh, it's, it's pretty interesting. But uh, those are those are very good. Um, if you've got some mechanical number or mechanical knowledge, I should say you should be able to knock that job out no problem. Like I said, I'll, I'll post a video here coming up next one I do if I get time. I'll uh, I'll tape it. Any other questions? Uh, anything? These are good. Hey, these last questions are are perfect questions. These are the kind of questions I was looking for. Um. You know, distributor carburation, um, all that stuff. All right, Mark says he uh, asked a question at eight twenty-five. Do I have a timestamp here? Is that what you said? You have an eighty thirty-six. I'm not sure what that means, Mark.
All right, Doug asked an interesting question. I'm uncomfortable trusting new hydraulic lifters. Would it be better to reuse the old? Well, that is a huge, huge problem right now in the engine rebuilding industry is hydraulic flat tappet lifters. Um, Johnson, which was probably one of the biggest companies uh, in the world that manufactured flat tappet lifters based in Michigan, they're now high lift. I, I I'll probably screw the story up, but I, I think high, either high lift bought them or, or Johnson bought, I think, I think high lift bought um, Johnson out, but the big problem with these lifters is, you know, OEs don't use them anymore. So OEs are, are, are all uh, hydraulic roller and, you know, overhead cam engines, you know, they, they have a stationary lifter. So outside of our old boats and old engines, you know, nobody's really using it. So these manufacturers have, gone away from it so you know for instance i just ordered some seal power lifters the other day and they say made in china all over them and you know a lot of folks in our in, in the engine building side of our business you know that they're freaking out and and i know the engine builders in our area a couple of them in the fremont area and, and uh specifically i talked to those guys quite a bit and one of them told me he says chris we're putting these engines together and and i've noticed this too one thing i do is i'll roll the engine over by hand once i adjust the valves and I want to make sure that lifter is spinning. And what you might want to do if you're really freaked out, Doug, which is not a bad idea, is I would I would mark your push rods. So I, I know it's a little bit of push ups, but th this is a technique that could get you out of a jam of a flat cam possibly. Is mark the position of the push rod against the cylinder head. So for instance, if you take the valve covers off, I, I assume this is a Chevy engine that we're talking about. I, I'm not sure, but. Um, uh, but uh, yeah, cause I think you had a 454 question earlier, but, um, mark the push rod. Let, let's say, um, you mark the push rod to where the intake manifold is, um, and then fire the motor up, run it for a couple, three minutes, and then take the valve covers back off and make sure that, make sure that push rod moved, you know, cause the, what happens is, is, is they're not spinning. And when they don't, when they don't rotate in the bore, it's, it's over, you know, um, I had an engine that we did last year that we had a cam go flat and uh, it had Chinese lifters and I had to put another cam and stuff in it. And it was fine after that. Um, but you know, everything's China. I know um, the top line stuff back to answer your question that the top line stuff, Johnson seems to be the best. Um, I, I don't know what SBI is using. I know uh, seal power is, is pretty much Chinese. Um, and it's tough because Del Delphi factory up there in Michigan, they are, they are strictly, uh, the, the OE stuff, they're strictly roller. So they're done as far as to my knowledge, they are done making hydraulic flat tappets. So, um, but yes, it's, um, <sighs> But to, to totally answer your question, I, I mean, yes, you, you could use the old, you know, in theory, you're supposed to mark them in the cylinder you took out, assuming you're reusing the cam. I, I assume you are. Um, if you put everybody back to where they were, it would be the best scenario. I always changed them. But like I say, we had better quality products two years ago. Um, but now that this is becoming a huge problem. You know, I, I've been I've been kind of letting them go. I've been, I've been buying what I can get, what I hope is the best, and and I've been checking them as when I build the engine. I, when I get done adjusting the valves, I put a little paint mark or whatever on the lifter, and I rotate the engine. And I'll tell you what I've had happen. You're gonna think I'm crazy, but I've had engines where lifters don't rotate. Let let's say for an example, you have uh, number three exhaust doesn't rotate, and let's say number. Uh, number number six intake doesn't rotate i have taken those lifters out of those two cylinders that don't rotate i've switched them and they rotate <laughs> so <laughs> it's uh just make sure they're spinning if they're spinning you're gonna you're gonna win um the other thing i will tell you too on a premature cam failure hydraulic flat tap it is the best thing you can do is make sure the engine starts right away um, there's nothing worse on a freshly rebuilt engine with a new cam, new lifters, you know, new springs, whatever. And let's say the distributor's not in time, the firing order's off, you know, the carburetor floods over or something like that. And you're doing a bunch of cranking, you right. And a bunch of cranking, you can kill a cam very, very quickly. 
you want that engine running, you know, instantaneously once you get it going. I know on our engines that I test run in the shop, I actually put an outboard primer ball in the fuel line and I actually fill the carburetor and, you know, I, and, and I'm ready to go. Uh, I actually take the flame arrestor off. I accelerate the throttle a couple of times, make sure I got two good squirts of fuel going in. And I know I'm ready to go because I do not want to waste any time cranking the engine over because that is the most vital period and the most important period of that camshaft's life is to get that thing up and going and get the RPM uh, elevated a little bit so that thing is getting lubed because all that cranking with no lube is no good. So, but yeah, the good question. Like I say, th these are great questions. I, th these are the kind of questions I was hoping for. Um, A, something I felt like I could answer, you know, <laughs> I didn't know what I was going to get here and put set myself up for this, but, um, but yeah, th these are, these are perfect. Um, any other questions from anybody out there? Hydraulic cams. Yeah. Oh, I, I know a lot of builders are, are flipping to roller cams too. I haven't done that yet because I can't, you know, we do a lot of ops rotation stuff and there's nobody granted. It's, I, I haven't found anybody that's ground and roller opposite rotation cams on, on, on a roller profile. I, I, ha I personally haven't seen that. So you're really stuck with flat tap it and, and getting cams. I just use the last two Chrysler cams I could get from Melling. You know, they've been on back order forever. I, I waited for Ford uh, opposite rotation cams, 302, 351, you know, small block Ford. And actually, I'm building a, a, a 260 interceptor right now. I mean, we waited, I think, four or five months. I mean, Melling kept kicking the date back, kicking the date back. And I, we contacted Pleasurecraft, and Pleasurecraft had a few cams left over from the old Skeena T days um, and uh, back in the 80s. And I got my hands on a couple of those. So now, and then as soon as I got my hands on those, then Melling had the cams available. So, of course, so now I've got some opposite rotation Ford cams. Um, but, um, you know, getting the problem with camshafts right now is getting cores. When I talk to cam grinders, they don't have cores. That is, that is their biggest problem. They've got the grinders to grind them. They've got the people to do it. I'm told they don't have the cores. So I don't, I don't know where all the cores went or the foundries or so forth, but, um, it, it's a problem. Anything else from anyone? Bueller. Then I'm going to scroll back up here, make sure I didn't miss anything else. I don't think so. Well, I don't see any other questions. Um, I don't think I missed anything. Well, I think we'll wrap it up then. Um, I appreciate you guys coming out. You know, like I say, I know it's a Sunday here in the, in the Midwest. I figured there was nothing going on. I thought, well, you know, if we could get some people together and talk some boat engines and stuff like that, I thought that would be kind of fun. So, I mean, for kind of just throwing this out there and, and, and uh, getting it set up, I'm, I'm kind of impressed how it went so far. So maybe we'll do it again. Um, like I say, email me suggestions. If there's something you liked or didn't like, or want to see if there's a topic you want to talk about, maybe we can do a live a streaming cast with that, you know, something that I could do a little preparation on. Um, you know, I, I would be more than happy, uh, to do that. You know, we could do an ignition deal. We could do a carburetor deal. Um, you know, a transmission deal, you know, any of that stuff. Uh, we can talk cars. If you guys want to talk cars, we can do that. Um, cause if you saw my video, I posted here not too long ago last week, we did a shop tour. Um, you know, we sell parts, we rebuild engines, we make hydraulic hoses, we rebuild starters and alternators, we rebuild distributors. We have a 10 bay auto repair shop, do a lot of factory programming. We do, uh, ADAS stuff. Um, I'm sure we'll be getting into electric cars here. So, um, we can, I'll, I'll talk anything you guys want to talk. 
So, um, but um, tell you what, um, I, I hope you guys have a great winter. Uh, I'm, hopefully we'll be back here soon talking if you guys want to, but um, thanks for watching and um, happy boating. We can't wait for spring to come around quick enough. So uh, you guys enjoy yourself, be safe, and uh, we'll talk soon. Thank you.